And welcome to everybody uh, that's here live. For those of you who may be watching this, we're recording the event. We welcome you as well. We're happy to be here live again. It's been a long time. We're here for a program featuring an amazing guest, the dangers posed by Iran, a Palestinian state, and President Biden's recent visit to Israel. Um, Brigadier General Amir Abibi, who I will introduce appropriately in a few minutes. First, I need to, to apologize on behalf of Mort, ZOA President Mort Klein. Uh, Mort was supposed to be here to introduce his friend Amir. Unfortunately, many of you know Mort was in an accident in February, an automobile accident, he and his wife, mm -hmm. uh, at which time he suffered a concussion. He was doing, he is doing much, much better. I need everybody to know. He's doing much, much better. But one of the symptoms of close concussive, we have some physicians in the room, um, is a, a tendency toward dizziness, a sporadic dizziness. And unfortunately, Mort was feeling a little bit dizzy this morning and decided that it wasn't prudent for him to come in. So he sends his apologies. <clears throat> I want to introduce uh, my ZOA colleagues that are here before we start. Uh, Dan Pollack, he's a director of our Government Relations Division, he spends his time in Washington, D.C. Liz Burney is our Director of Special Projects and Research. She works out of this office and out of uh, home. Michelle Clark is our Director of Development. Nancy Hollander is our Office Manager and Director of Operations. Jackie Schaefer is Communications Manager and much, much more. Thank you, Jackie, for everything you do for us. And um, before I introduce uh, our speaker, uh, please indulge me for a minute while I talk a little bit about what's happening at ZOA. Uh, so ZOA President Mort Klein has been appearing regularly on TV and on radio, and of course he's published in various media with regularity. So watch our emails, we send out links to all of his publications, and um, Michelle and I love to get responses if there's anything you'd like to talk about, our email addresses are easy to find. Dan, uh, in Washington, is constantly meeting with senators, congresspeople, and their staffers, uh, sharing truth and facts about Israel. And in the last two weeks, Dan was approached and invited by both the Turkish and Polish embassies, both asking for Dan to suggest to them what their governments can do to find favor with Israel. It's a, it's a neat feather in our cap. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Liz tires, tirelessly works on project after project after project, whether it's holding corporate giants like Unilever to task for documenting the historical and current malign hostile to Israel activities of so many Biden appointees. Liz, thank you for everything you're doing. If Susan Tuckman were here, she would tell you that she spent a lot of her time these past few weeks writing a brief on behalf of a case that we're working on in Clifton, New Jersey. Sad, but this is happening all over the country. In Clifton, New Jersey, two members of the Clifton Board of Education are using their Board of Education positions to bash Israel publicly on an elected public forum, and uh, we're representing someone who is taking them to task. Please God will be successful. Uh, they're going so far into bashing Israel that they've actually opened an SJP chapter at the Clifton High School. And we normally see that reserved for college campuses. It's, it's a very frightening move. Speaking of college campuses, uh, our ZOA campus staff, and we're on 100 college campuses across the country, just about, it, it, we, we go over and above 100 uh, campuses. They're planning their next ZOA trip to Israel, student mission to Israel. That's going to take place the last week of December into the first week of uh, January. They have to work with the, uh, with the um, academic calendars. And campus is actively recruiting now for uh, ZOA fellowships across the country. So if you know a student that loves Israel, would like to learn how to be an advocate, maybe wants to go to Israel and learn how to be an advocate, get in touch with myself or Michelle. We'll put you in touch with campus. These are great opportunities, so don't let them pass, please. Michelle and I work together, uh, largely. Uh, we make sure that you guys know what's happening at ZOA and candidly. Um, we're the ones who ask you for help supporting ZOA financially. But we don't only ask you for help financially, we ask you, we try to make you partners. There are a lot of ways that we can use your help, so pull Michelle or me aside. I think Michelle's going to talk a little bit about that when she closes the program later today. You'll notice that I did not yet speak about ZOA activities surrounding Iran-Palestine issue or President Biden's recent trip. Let me give you a little bit. We've hung seven-story banners in Jerusalem, partnered with the Iranian Americans for Liberty. Uh, their founder was supposed to be with us today. He got, side, he got uh, distracted. This is a non-Jewish Muslim, mostly Muslim Iranian group that supports Zionist causes and uh, you can find this online if you want me to direct you. We've opened a webpage, nonuclearholocaust.com, and they're helping us to seek the peaceful overthrow of the malign Iranian regime. Um, 
we were very active and upfront fighting <clears throat> the prospect, sorry, <clears throat> post-COVID, fighting the Arab embassy in Jerusalem. Uh, we were the loudest and uh, most fearless so far, we're successful, although the administration worked around that, which I mean, may discuss it, I don't know. Uh, ZOA believes that Iran is the most dangerous issue, not only to Israel's security, but to the entire Middle East and the world at large. We're loud and clear about our opposition to a Palestinian state for a myriad of reasons, which again, I'm sure Amir will touch on. And lastly, ZOA spoke clearly about our opposition to Israel bestowing the Presidential Medal of Honor upon President Biden. Uh, we thought that was actually a really bad idea. <clears throat> But today, I really don't need to speak to these issues because I have with us Brigadier General Amir Abibi. Amir is the founder and CEO of Habib Khanistim, Israel's Defense and Security Forum or, <coughs> Forum, or IDSL. IDSL boasts more than 4,200 high-ranking reserve officers, commanders, and operators from all branches of the Israel security establishment. Amir has an impressive military career spanning more than 30 years and crossing many military disciplines achieving many high-ranking positions. Amir holds an MBA, an MA, and a BA, all from three top-tier Israeli universities. But most important to us here at ZOA, Amir took an entire day, an entire day, this is an important guy, an entire day out of his incredibly busy schedule to lead our ZOA mission in Israel to two really incredible places. He brought us to an urban warfare training base near Tse'elim, close to the Egyptian border. Nobody gets to see these things. And he brought us to Camel Hill Lookout, just a few hundred meters from the Gaza border. When we were there, there's a funny story. If anybody pulls me aside, Amit is your friend, right? Amit said, Alan, you better smile because they're watching. And he was serious. He said that so that the people on the trip couldn't hear. <clears throat> there is no, I can tell you there's no better informed guy in Israel than Amir. He's an amazing guy. And the last thing I'm going to tell you before I let Amir take over. When I spoke to Mort yesterday, and we we're talking about the program today, and I said to Mort just casually, you know, this is a really good group, meaning how Beat Clinic Steam Mort says to me, Alan, this is a great group. This is a great group. They're fearless. I said, Habit Clinic Steam is like ZOA in Israel. I'm sorry, I can't be there. With that, I'm here. Thank you, General. I'm here. Thank you very much, Alan. With all the compliments, I should have brought my wife. <laughs> <laughs> and I wish uh, more uh, the best, and really I appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak for 125 years old organization. It's, uh, it's amazing. So a few words about myself. So I'm Amir Abibi. Uh, I was born in Jerusalem. I come from a 15th generation family in Jerusalem, who okay. came from Spain to Saloniki in 1620 to the old city. So. Um, all my family still lives in Jerusalem. Um, I spent most of my young life outside of Israel. My father was a prominent uh, diplomat. So I lived five years in Italy, five years in South America, in uh, Chile and Argentina, and three years in the Ivory Coast. Graduated from a British high school and came back at the age of 18 to join uh, the army. I served 30 years. Uh, from those 30 years, um, uh, I would mention I was a battalion commander. I commanded 800 soldiers in uh, Operation Defensive Shield. And the two very, very complex years in Judea and Samaria following the retreat from the Palestinian city, the, the, the heavy price that the Israeli society has paid for that. Um, after that, I was uh, appointed the uh, aide de camp of the Chief of General Staff of uh, Lieutenant General Moshe Bogi Elon. In this uh, capacity, I had the opportunity to really see things on the national level, participate in cabinet meetings, uh, manage uh, on behalf of the chief of staff all the operations of uh, the IDF, coordinate them in, in its office, the intelligence and the international relations. Uh, from there, I went back to the field. I commanded the, the Egyptian border. I was deputy division commander of the Gaza Strip and commander of School of Combat Engineers. And my last position was the chief auditor of the, all the Israeli defense establishment, the army, the Ministry of Defense, and the military industries. When I say auditing, I don't mean, mean bus, just budget or like CFO. I'm talking about auditing readiness for war. Uh, I audited uh, the IDF's readiness to attack Iran. 
I have replaced the idea so I didn't have to wage war on Lebanon. And so I really got to see things uh, in depth of what's going on in the Israeli defense establishment. I'll tell you two short stories that were part of uh, shaping the way I, I see things in Israel and uh, my decision to two years ago to uh, start a new organization. The first one was when I was a battalion commander. As we were fighting in Judea and Samaria for months, uh, we got a few uh, weeks to organize ourselves. And I had a talk with all of my battalion, 800 soldiers. And I asked a simple question. How many of you soldiers have been in Jerusalem? Isn't it like a stupid question to ask an Israeli? <laughs> Half of my battalion has never been in Jerusalem. Wow. They are Israelis. Wow. So I asked the half that were in Jerusalem, how many of you have been in the Kotel? Only half. So only a quarter of my battalion has been in Jerusalem and been in the Kotel. So I said to myself, okay, do these guys know what they're fighting for when they're fighting in Judea and Samaria? And the answer was obvious, no. So we had a very short uh, list and to organize ourselves and go back in combat. And I decided instead of doing one more week of training, which was very, which was very important, because we didn't have a, a lot of time to train, I took all my battalion for a whole week in Jerusalem, starting in the, in the city of David, the Kotel, the tunnels, the old city, the new city, uh, the Knesset, uh, and the um, Supreme Court. And in the last day, all the 800 soldiers sat in the president's house and had a talk with the president. <laughs> and I can tell you that when we, when we went back to combat, this was a completely different battalion. These guys knew and understood what they are fighting for. But I understood that there is a huge, huge problem in the education system in, in Israel. This education system is not educating anymore for patriotism, for Zionism, for Jewish connection. It's just about educating to excel in studies, to go to high tech, things like that. And when Somebody doesn't know almost anything about his heritage and history. It's very easy to convince this young generation to adopt the Palestinian narrative and forget who we are. And this is happening also here in the States, just the same. But it's amazing that it's happening in Israel for many years. The other thing that uh, really shook me when I was in the army, when I was at the camp of the chief of staff, at that time, as I said, we were after Operation Defensive Shield, still fighting in Judea and Samaria, and at the same time, Gaza was a complete mess. It was after Oslo, after we retreated from the main cities of Gaza. Immediately after this retreat in 95, uh, they started building military industries. They started to develop uh, rockets and mortars and other capabilities. And this was at the peak of the so-called uh, peace process. We knew that. We didn't do anything. And in 2000, they started shooting at the road, at the settlements and so on, making life impossible, building tunnels, explosive tunnels, and exploding underneath uh, military installation. So Gaza was a mess. And um, as this was happening, Event after event, one day the chief of staff and me we sit in the uh, in the Kiria and they tell us open the TV. We open the TV and we see the Minister of Israel Sharon saying in the Celia summit, I I'm going to disengage from Gaza. And we're looking shocked. What do you mean disengage? Like, it's a war here. We are, we are fighting. Where will we go? So this was pretty shocking. We immediately 
brought the general and started assessing the situation, and a few days later, we had the cabinet meeting. Well, I attended this cabinet meeting. I was sitting, you know, not on the table, <laughs> the table with the chief of staff, and, and um, Sharon said, okay, I decided to disengage. What's the assessment? I hope you know that usually you assess first and then decide, but that's Sharon. So Bogi says to him, uh, Prime Minister, listen, if you disengage like that from Gaza, in one year, Gaza will become Hamastan and Kaidastan and Hezbollah. This is what's going to happen. It's going to be terror land. So he asked Richter, Richter was head of Shimbet, what do you think? He said exactly what uh, Bogi said. If you connect Gaza to, to Egypt, endless amount of terror, money, know-how, technology is going to go, munition, going to go into Gaza and out of Gaza, and we are not going to lose control. And although the defense establishment said to the prime minister that this is going to happen, he said, okay, I heard you, but this is what we are doing. So we leave the office, and maybe two months later, he decides to fire Bogi. I was also present at this event. And then he brought another uh, chief of staff, Halus. And Halus was brought to carry out the disengagement. And what happened next was incredible to me. Um, a month after Halut takes office, suddenly the IBF releases a notice saying it's not going to be Hamastan, it's going to be Singapore. Yeah. The engagement will bring peace. And I was saying, how can the defense establishment, the army, that is a professional organization, not political one, they know it's going to be Hamastan. How can they say now it's going to be Singapore? We know it's not true. But people, you know, are worried about their careers, they want promotion, they want the chief of staff to be happy, and uh, this is what happened. But this wasn't all. At the same time, on the public sphere, we had all these uh, generals uh, writing letters, interviewing, saying, yes, the disengagement to win peace. Now, I was looking at all of these events, and I said to myself, that I am witnessing an historical moment where all the Israeli defense establishment collapsed. The cabinet, the army, the retired generals, all of them. And then I said to myself, if this happens again in Judea and Samaria and the Jordan Valley, that's it. There is no Israel anymore. So looking at the education and looking at the way uh, the defense establishment handled itself and the, all these generals understood that if we don't build a very dominant and strong voice of uh, generals and commanders uh, that will educate and advocate for a strong Israel or ensuring Israel's national security without any other agenda, not politics and not other things, uh, Israel might pretty much destroy itself at a certain point. Uh, there is much more likelihood that we will destroy ourselves than anybody from outside will destroy us. Um, so two years ago, I decided, okay, that's it. I'm going to do something about it. And in the 1st of January 2020, I started calling some generals and saying, Friends, this is the time we need to build a new organization uh, in the movement, not just uh, high-ranking people, but a large movement. And uh, maybe at the end of the first week, I had something like uh, six, seven uh, high-ranking officers. And one week passes, there's nothing yet. And suddenly, Netanyahu announces that he wants to apply sovereignty to the Jordan Valley. And I said to myself, wow, this is an historical moment, applying sovereignty in the Jordan Valley. This will ensure Israel's security for, for generations. This is very important. But what do you do? That's one week. I don't have an organization, not a bank account, nothing. 
And I decided that I cannot stay silent because at, at that moment that Netanyahu said that he wants to apply sovereignty to the Jordan Valley, immediately uh, the media, ex-generals, and so on started attacking the idea. I said, okay, I need to say something. So I asked uh, a girl that was working with me, I said to her, listen, by tomorrow morning I need a logo. She says to me, are you crazy? What do you mean? She says, Branding takes months. I said, okay, tomorrow morning. <laughs> so the next morning I had the logo, pretty much the same one until we have today. And I wrote a letter to Netanyahu with my six, seven generals, saying that the big holistic movement, seven people, we support applying sovereignty in the Jordan Valley, and we explained why and so on. And they we had an organization that volunteered to pay for an ad in the newspaper of this, uh, of this uh, uh, that we wrote. And this had huge traction. People haven't heard generals like that, talking like that for ages. And, and in one, two weeks, 300 officers joined the organization. Now, after two years, one we are more than 5,000. So this is growing very fast, and of course, after we 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 build the organization, we say, okay, what, what we know what we, what's the mission? The mission is to ensure Israel's security and prosperity for generations. But what, what needs to be done for this to actually happen? And we understood that we need to deal with the I would say three or four main issues. One, going back to the story about the my soldiers at Jerusalem educating the young generation. The young generation has been deprived of their identity. They, they are not taught who they are, what it means to be Am Israel, what it means to, co to be connected to the land of Israel, what it means to, to be willing to sacrifice and fight for, for your country. And then um, we are deploying our thousands of officers to the pre-army programs and now also to the high school. Uh, we presented uh, plans for uh, uh, to the Ministry of uh, Education, and now we are starting to educate also in high schools and universities. And I can tell you of from hundreds of encounters with the young generation, which we are also bringing into the movement, uh, that they need this identity. They are looking for it. So once you start talking. Uh, patriotism, Zionism, Jewish connection, people are lit up. They, they want this connection and they, and they need it. And they need to understand also the, the security needs of the state of Israel. And they need to understand what needs to be done and why it's important to serve. And this is what we are doing and it's moving very fast and very good. And now we are also getting requests to do it with a high school here in the States. This is a process to take our time, but, but definitely something that uh, we need to do. The other thing is, you want to dominate the narrative, you need to dominate media, media and social media. So we deploy dozens of officers and researchers uh, to uh, the mainstream media in Israel, radio, television, and newspapers. Uh, we are very active in social media in Israel. And we are starting to grow this also abroad. We have now a PR company international. Uh, tomorrow, for example, I'm going to, to early in the morning to interview Newmax. Uh, we need to do we need to interview the Fox News, but we need to grow this. Um, and today in every security event, every major issue, our voice is very strong and uh, across all media uh, outlets uh, in Israel. And the third thing is, and, and this is what you guys, guys are doing of course as well, is uh, researching and, and talking to decision makers. So we have a very strong research department, we are writing papers, and now we wrote a very big paper uh, which was will be the main thing I will talk today uh, about the main uh, challenges of Israel 
in the years uh, to come. We presented it to Netanyahu two weeks ago to the chief of police. Uh, we have a meeting with the chief of staff of Israel, of uh, the IDF. Uh, we have a meeting with the president of Israel. And uh, of course, we'll, we'll meet the other parties as well. And, and this uh, voice is growing and becoming very strong. We are also very uh, active with diplomats and the Congress, Senate. Um, and I think this is important because this is an authority voice of generals who have served many, many years in the army and know what they are talking about. And uh, the, the first message we, we say about how we look at national security, there is no national security without nationalism. If you are not proud, you are not patriotic, if you are not Zionist, no tank and no airplane will help. There will be no spirit, no willingness to fight. And this is the main thing that we need to, to deal with. Now, talking about the challenges. The challenges we have are not new, but they have changed a lot. We are dealing with two main big challenges. One is the Iranian build-up of force. The Iranians are moving very fast towards uh, nuclear capability. And um, they are building a huge force around us. Uh, they are equipping Hezbollah with more than 100,000 rockets and mortars and drones and missiles. Uh, the same is happening in Gaza, in Iraq, in Yemen, and in Iran itself. I don't know if you know that, but last year in the operation, when, we, when there was the operation in, in Gaza, Iran shot at us from Iraq and from Yemen. The shooting was not very successful, but they are building these capabilities, rockets, missiles, drones, also in Yemen and in Iraq. They are targeting Saudi Arabia, UAE from these places, but they are also building this force against uh, Israel. Now, Iranians have been doing that for many, many years. But the change is that this uh, threat evolved to the stage well, it's almost ready, uh, and they are very close to being uh, nuclear, and they are very close to have enough power, talking about all these militias, that they can decide in the next year or two to wage a war. And, and this war might be very surprising, because taking account that when Hamas shot Jerusalem a year ago, we knew about that only an hour before, that's it. This kind of war is not like the war we see in Russia where we saw for months preparations and tanks and APCs. You cannot wage a war with ground forces without a lot of preparation and then you know that something is happening. But when you're talking about missiles and rockets and drones, this is pushing a button, that's it. You won't, we won't necessarily know before might be very surprising, as it was a year ago when they shot Jerusalem. We had one hour before just we, we knew that this is going to happen. This is not enough to do anything. Certainly not bring reserves and all of that. So the Iranian issue is evolving. And at the end of the day, the next year, two or three, either we need to attack them, and then it's a full-scale war, or that will surprise us. And still, it's going to be a big war. And, and I, if I talked about that four years ago, or, it wouldn't be the same assessment. So the, there's a huge possibility that in the next coming years, we'll have to deal with this Iranian threat. It's almost imminent. The other thing is the Palestinian issue. The Palestinian issue completely changed. It looks nothing like anything we saw before. And I want to explain what I mean. Usually when we talk about the Palestinians, we talk about Gaza as if it's one thing. We talk about the Palestinian Authority, different thing. And then we talk about Israeli Arabs. They are all together different things. But this is not the reality. The reality is that there is one campaign, Hamas, 
parts of the Israeli Arab society, Palestinians in Judea and Samaria, one coordinated campaign to destroy Zionism in Israel. And the way this campaign is, uh, is being waged is in three ways. One is grabbing the land illegally. So we see a whole campaign in Judea and Samaria and Area C, the Palestinians doing a national campaign with a lot of money from Europe to take over the land. They learned how we operated the beginning of the Zionism. They took the exactly the same ideas and methods, and now they're doing it to us. So we see it in Judea and Samaria. At the same time, we see a takeover of Bed Bedouins taking over the Negev in an alarming pace. We see the same in the Galil, and we see the same in its cities, everywhere, with a lot of money coming from Arab countries and coming from Europe, and all coordinated and planned. The second thing that they are doing is targeting the, the personal security of Israelis, of Jews everywhere. Jews in Israel today are not safe almost anywhere. Not in the Negev, not in Judea and Samaria, not in the mixed cities, not in Jerusalem, not in the Galilee. And uh, we, we did a survey how people feel, how safe as they feel in the different places. Uh, in most places it was like 9%, 12%. In West Jerusalem it was 45%, that was the highest. So people are not feeling safe. And the third thing they are doing, and this is something that is already a global issue, it's not only what's happening in Israel, is fighting the very basic right of Jews to have a state at all. Nobody on the other side is talking about the two-state solution. It's all about Palestine will be free from the river to the sea. I hope you understand that in this scenario we are in the sea. And so this is what's happening. When they talk today about settlers, I'm not talking about Jews in Samaria, they're talking about Jews who live in the Negev, they're talking about Jews who live in Jerusalem, in Lod, in Acre, in Jaffa, as settlers. So while we Jews are wasting our time fighting each other, talking about whether we need to stay, not to stay, yes, Judah and Samaria, no Judah and Samaria, this fight is completely irrelevant. Because on the other side, they are undermining us. They are undermining Zionism from, from scratch. And this is what we need to deal with now when when I look at what would be a possible scenario uh, that Israel might need to be ready in the next two or three years, is basically the intersection of these two threats. So basically, if we look what happened last year, we had more than 4,000 rockets shot from Gaza, but at the same time, we had an uprising inside Israel and then attacking Jews in the cities. It was pretty traumatic, but still it was in a very small scale. But in two, three years, we might find ourselves with a full-scale war against Iran, with hundreds of thousands of rockets and missiles and mortars, and maybe they will reach nuclear capabilities. And at the same time, we might see a full-scale uprising inside Israel, which we need to be ready for. So what we, what we say to the Israeli government is we need, first of all, to define what is happening. Because when I let, look, for example, at the takeover of the land, this is maybe the most existential threat we have. It's not that Israel is not dealing good enough with this campaign. It's not dealing at all, not doing anything. We're not even on the same playground. It's like we're playing cricket and they're playing rugby. So we're not defining right what is going on. We are in a war. The war is now. It's happening. 
and we need to fight back. We need to stop the illegal grabbing of land. We need to push back on that. But we also need to go to the most basic things in Zionism, settling again our land, taking care of the open areas, building new towns. Now, look, for many years, from the beginning of uh, Israel till maybe Oslo, it's hard to pinpoint the exact moment. It didn't matter how much the Arabs wanted to fight us and challenge us. Zionism was winning. We were growing, getting stronger, building towns, bringing Jews to Israel, flourishing, and so on. In the last two or three decades, Zionism is in full stop, full stop. It's not in the schools. We're not settling anything. We're not building anything. And at the same time, they are taking over. Every day, every minute that passes, they are winning and we are losing. Now, somebody might say to me, are you crazy? Look, the IDF is strong, and their technology is amazing, and the economy is strong, and we did peace with Arab countries. This is all true. But this is the Israeli Jewish paradox. On one hand, since the days of King Solomon, we are probably in, in the peak of the Jewish people ever. We have a strong country, strong economy, Jews are doing well. We look where we are sitting. I look on one side, I see the Chrysler building, the other side, I see the Empire State building. We are doing well. But this is like a beautiful apple when you look at it. And inside, there is a worm eating it. And outside, somebody wants to take this apple from the tree and eat it. And if you look at history overall, whether it's the Roman Empire, the Greek Empire, any empire, the fall was always at the peak. When everything seemed like on the outside OK, but inside, there were problems. We cannot afford to fall. We were kicked twice from our land. We spent 2,000 years in exile. This is not going to happen again. If we lose our country again, that's it. There will be no Jewish people. So we need to fight. We need to fight. And I think that people feel, like, feel that. This is why, in very short time, 5,000 officers joined. And I'm telling you, that by the end of this year, there will be 10,000. People understand that we need to fight for our land. And we need to fight for the Jews around the world because anti-Semitism is growing to an alarming state and it's not going to stop. And fighting anti-Semitism is not about dealing with the anti-Semites. It's about us, about educating our own people to remember who they are. To be proud again, you know, being a Jew was always hard. But people felt that they are part of a Delta Force of the nation. <laughs> now, if you are Delta Force, of course it's hard, you know, a top unit. But you are proud, you are willing to, to sweat and work hard because you are in a top unit. But if people tell you that you are nothing, and not only that you are like everybody else, but you are less, because you are an oppressor, you are apartheid, and I don't know why. So why bother? So we have a lot, a lot of work to do in building our Jewish proudness and remembering who we are and our connection to the land of Israel and the people of Israel. And um, I think that overall, uh, I would say, generally speaking, um, I think that right-wingers overall are not very good at dealing with, uh, I would call it, uh, narrative campaigns. I think that the radical left excels at that. that, that, that they, they understand that this is the real issue. And this is why we see in the US today from kindergarten the fight over the story and the narrative. 
So we are good at building synagogues, we are good at buying land, but the fight, the real fight is over the story, it's over the narrative. And this is what, what we are dealing with. Um, so th there are new challenges, but um, I feel now in Israel, especially after the last government and the uh, first, I would say, non-Zionist government in Israel, that people are awake. People are not willing anymore to endure this. They understand that Zionism is a, a huge danger, and they, they are willing to do something about it. And I feel that we definitely all here share the same values and the, an apologetic uh, approach when it comes to defending the people of Israel and the state of Israel. So for me, really, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. I would really appreciate if you have questions. Uh, thank you.